All right. Okay, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, uh, Mr. Darius Boomer. Darius Boomer is the founder and CEO of Boomer Technology Group, which spe uh, specializes in technology planning, process improvement, and software impl implementations. Darius has an undergraduate degree in management science from Keene University. Darius Boomer has worked for Fortune 500 companies since he was 16, each that had taught him perseverance, leadership, and drive for success. Drive for success. His tenure at companies such as IBM, Tiffany & Company, Polo, Ralph Lauren, and Accenture has afforded 20 plus years of corporate experience. He has traveled the globe implementing technology systems in Europe, North America, and Asia. His model is have let top that will travel. Please let me welcome Mr. Darius Boomer. Thank you. So uh, good morning, guys. Uh, thank you guys for having me today. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys today about technology innovation trends for Fortune 500 companies. Um, my hope today is that you guys are going to learn a few things that you don't already know and that we'll have a QA at the very end of my conversation with you guys this morning. So first of all, again, I'm Darius Boomer. Like Boomer Asai, it's actually my last name is Boomer. Um, my company is Boomer Technology Group, and what we do in a nutshell is companies will buy some ERP software, and they'll have my company come inside and either configure the software for them or project manage their software um, rollout for them across the globe. So I've been doing that for the last 20 some odd years, and um, deep down inside, I'm a pure techie. I love tech. I eat, I sleep, I drink tech day in and day out. I'm a total nerd. However, being a total nerd in this planet will get you a long way in life. So again, I hope to have some fun with you guys today, have some Q&A at the end, and you know, let me know when I'm at, at the end of my conversation here because I'll go too long. I'll go for three hours if you don't stop me. So um, <laughs> today's agenda, I'm going to talk about my career with a few good funny stories, and hopefully it will give you guys some ideas about your life going <laughs> forward from Penn State once you graduate as an undergraduate student or go to graduate school, how are you going to chart your course for your career path? And I tell people, I don't have a job. I have a career. And no matter what happens in my career, I can take this anywhere on the planet. It could be in America, South America, Asia, Europe, wherever I go, my career path is steady and growing each day in, day out. So real quick, some tidbits for you guys. Um, your tech career flow chart, if you will, for your life. This was me at 18 years of age going to undergraduate school, trying to figure out my way in life and how am I going to get from being a freshman in college to becoming a retired man at some point and happy. So in the beginning, I'm green, I'm happy, but I'm open to possibilities out there in the, in the workforce. So first of all, you guys are undergrad here, correct? Well, undergrads here? OK. So at some point in your career path, you're going to leave this school and get your first job. In your first job, you're going to either be a worker bee, you may become certified, you may go into becoming a manager or an executive in your next 10 years of your life, if not longer or sooner. If you go back to college again, you can go to graduate school and be a PhD. No matter how you go about this course in your career path, you're going to at some point have an alignment in yourself in regards to technology. You're going to be aligned to a software package or a hardware platform or a process. You're also going to have an assignment to a department and to an industry. So in my career path, I've been in an IT department. So I've been aligned to IT systems. I've done some software implementations in the last 20 some odd years as also hardware. But no matter what I do for software or for hardware, there's always going to be an underlying process at hand. So if you're in HR, it's HR systems. If you're in payroll, it's payroll systems. If you're in applications, whatever the case might be, you're going to chart your course of your life through these three things happening to you in your career path. So I'm aligned to three industries that I sell myself to as a consultant. The first one being retail, followed by manufacturing, followed by healthcare. Again, I'm an IT guy, so it's always the IT department, but my clients are usually HR or payroll people or in finance. So again, as you think about your, your path, as you guys climb your, your career path, it's a full life cycle, right? You start off at the bottom, it's to the next level, 
But no matter where you go again, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an employee at a company, you're always going to have the same thing aligned to you. Some software, some hardware, and a process. Lastly, you'll be assigned to a department of some type in your company and an industry. If you can master a software package, you get some nice money. If you can master some hardware, software, hardware you make some nice money if you're a specialist. If you're aligned to a department, if you're a payroll person for life, or if you're in HR or whatever it might be, if you become an expert in that field, you get paid nicely. If you're aligned to an industry, if you stay in that one industry, you become an expert in that industry. You get paid for becoming a specialist. My hope for you guys will be that at the end of your life cycle of you being an employee or an entrepreneur, ready to retire, that at some point you're going to come back and give back to students, right? Full life cycle. How to become successful for you guys, real quick. I've got 10 things that I've used in the last 20 odd years of my life to get me where I'm at today. So number one, become an SME, a subject matter expert. Um, know your value in the open market and how to negotiate your value. Um, always be a student. So no matter what you're doing in IT, always learn something new every single year. If you get a new job, ask them about their training program, some training money for yourself. Um, the next thing here, be prepared for change. We're in IT. This industry is meant on innovation and change day in and day out. So be prepared for it to change every single 18 months for the next new hot thing and how it's going to affect your life and your company. Last thing here, spread the wealth of knowledge and time and your money. Whatever you're doing for your current field going forward, you may change fields. But always spread the wealth of who you are. Again, your knowledge base, your time with people, volunteering, and money. Next thing, set goals and expectations for yourself. Make a plan, execute your plan, review your plan, and lastly, adjust your plan. Am I winning? Am I losing? If I'm losing, change my plan, right? Here's one that's really, really important for guys and girls. Fail fast and furious. If you're going to go and do a new startup next year with your friends here at school, and you do it for like two years, and you decide in two years' time, we're failing miserably. Fail fast and furious, and then change your course to success. Don't take yourself 10 years to realize, I suck at this. You know what? I should probably move to another career path. Don't take 10 years. Do it fast. Do it furious. And realize at a certain point, you know what? This is not working for me. I got to move on. Um, throughout your career path, think about what's out there for you for new opportunities. For myself, I started off at my first company at 16 at McDonald's. That is a Fortune 500 company, yes. And from that for the, for the company, I learned a few things about process, how to work with people, how to be successful in that company as a burger flipper, right? My first job, how to clean their stores. That gave me some kind of mindset about how to run a business. Thinking about that 16-year-old mindset, I'm flipping a burger for somebody for a check. But again, I actually learned about business process, about retail, about how to take in cash at a register. It's about how to run a business. That was my foundation to where I'm at today. So for you guys, your path of going, to going forward is anything you do for a new job, if I take this new job for more money, what am I going to learn when I get there? Who am I going to meet when I get there? As an opportunity to myself. Lastly, I tell this to my kids. If you're going to get up every single day and go to class, go to school, go to work, go anywhere, make your presence known. Don't just be here and be quiet. If you're going to be in a building, make your presence known. Be a leader. I want to know that you're here. OK? And real quick, my last thing for you guys, I call it the 10 Tech Commandments. For any business that you do on this, this planet, I believe these are the 10 <laughs> things you should do that makes you a real technologist in this field. Number one, tech should innovate. Tech should automate. It should improve current processes. It should remove things that are inefficient. But lastly, technology should maximize your return on investment. If you're not doing these five things here in your job, then you suck at it. We're not here to do tech just for a check. 
we're here to save people's lives and change lives in some capacity. If we can innovate, I want you to give me some time back. Create jobs for people. Build nations. I want you to go out there and improve our planet. And then lastly, improve my life. Think about your smartphone. I'm an iPhone guy. This thing is a smartphone, right? It's going to improve my life. I can ask Siri things to give me time back. Siri, do things for me that are automated, right? So in your career path going forward, here go my Ten Commandments. If you can do these things in your career path, you're a good person. You're doing great. So the last 110 years of technology, we've gone leaps and bounds in technology in regards to your home life and your business real life. So you guys are Generation Z, correct? Am I correct? So going forward, how are you guys going to change the world? Well, here's one career path I can tell you about what's what I do. And hopefully you'll go over some trends today. And you'll walk out of here today a little bit smarter than you are right now, hopefully. So I work on something called ERP packages, which stands for Enterprise Resource Planning Software. So any big company on the planet is going to buy some ERP package. It could be an SAP. It could be a PeopleSoft, an Oracle. It could be a Workday, a Lawson, a Ceridian, or some other off-the-shelf package. In this software package, these companies want to run their departments efficiently and do automation of some, of some type. So you've got accounting, HR, whatever your company does in an ERP package traditionally, that runs your company's business. So if I were a small company in my house using MS Office with five employees, well, that's cute with five employees. But what if we're like 10,000 employees across the globe? Am I going to use MS Office anymore? No. I'm going to buy an ERP package. So ERP packages have been around for decades. I mentioned the word SAP. It began in 72. I mentioned Lawson. You guys know who Microsoft is. Kronos, et cetera. In the last 10 years, there have been a certain type of um, industry consolidation happening with these companies. And I want to kind of go over some actual trends that are happening. So number one, AI. It's big. It's a big popular thing happening across the board. It's not going to stop at any given time. When we say AI, it doesn't mean a robot walking into the room doing your job, per se. When we say AI, it can purely be you know, a phone call to your favorite retailer, and you're talking to a robot. right? That could be an AI interface happening with, between you as a customer. In business, we want to use AI for two reasons. Number one, we want to cut down our cost. Number two, we're trying to be more efficient with how we use AI. We're not trying to replace bodies. We want to literally replace bad processes. So if I call up, again, back to my previous scenario, if I call up to a company about my shirt was incorrect when I bought it yesterday, that could be a person on the telephone. Or it could be a robot telling me how to walk through the actual return process, right, to be more efficient for a company. Uh, the next thing here, Internet of Things and smart devices. Um, Think about that in two capacities. If you're a developer, if you're creating the actual hardware for these platforms, if you're creating the software for these platforms, what if you're the guy that has to do, actually train people how to use that platform? So across the board in front of the companies, they're using this concept of smart devices in all kinds of ways. If you're in healthcare, how do I put a device on my hand and make sure it tells me my heart beats per minute? Tell my, tell my doctor what's happening with me. Um, think about if you're working with um, a manufacturer, a device that tells me where I'm at in the building in regards to my assembly lines happening. So again, IoT is going to be a big thing going forward. So if you guys are developers for small applications, um, it's not a bad space for you to go out there and make your apps be able to talk to these giant ERP packages that are out in the marketplace. The next thing, right, the next hot thing is blockchain and digital currency. Um, we're all talking about digital currency where I can give you a transaction between me and you. I'm here in the US, and maybe you're over in Thailand. And it's a peer-to-peer -peer conversation between me and you. I want to buy that computer from you in Thailand. You're going to sell it to me. And using blockchain currency, I can send you my money directly without using Chase or Bank of America, because between me and you directly, right? Well, that's just one usage 
of digital currency or if you're using blockchain. But think about the following. Think about if I want to send my medical records to your company through blockchain, I don't need to do that anymore in our current mindset. I can use it through a blockchain connection between you and my health provider. Or if I were doing some other way of, let's say we're going to send out our, if I buy a house next month from some mortgage company, it's going to give me some actual financing of my money. I can give them my information of who I am as the actual purchaser of this house through a blockchain conversation between me and that company itself. So again, don't think about it just in regards to money. Think about what it can do beyond the currency part of blockchain. Does that make sense? Okay. <coughs> too far. Three more trends for you guys um, in regards to industries making a big difference. The next one here is going to be cloud implementations and software as a service. So companies are moving away from having a hard server in their building, right? It costs them money. It costs them time to buy the right resource to actually maintain that hardware in their company. So going to more of a cloud solution across the board, it makes sense to everyone. They've been fighting it for decades. But now they're starting to see the light now, saving money and also expertise. And I'll give you an example. Um, I've got a software package called Kronos and Workday. In that software package, if you purchase a Workday application for your HR system, you're required to do an upgrade four times a year. So think about that. If I have a company of 100,000 employees and we're going to change our software four times a year, Who's going to test this software so it's not broken for us? Who's going to make sure it's not having an issue for every kind of user in my company? I've got a desktop user in the US, in Europe, in Japan, different keyboards, different languages in this software package. So as a company, do I want to have to have a whole staff maintain a simple software upgrade four times a year? Most of the answer is no. So we'll outsource it to the cloud and have the vendor run our updates for us automatically. We'll subscribe to their software in the cloud. And my IT support team is three or four people now because we're, we're out of that business now. It's been outsourced to the cloud, and the vendor is going to make sure we're whole. Does that make sense? OK. Social media, right? Ever expanding in America and across the globe, right? We've got all kinds of things that we're using. So for the last decade or so, companies have been trying to uh, not use that too much. And I'll, I'm seeing a trend in two capacities. I'm seeing companies now who have their own company intranet, right? It's our own company network or whatever. It could be a home page. It could be a SharePoint site. But now they'll have their own version of social media. They'll have Jammer, where I can now chat to my employees in the company. We can do video chatting in the company. We can do our own kind of Facebook in the company's four walls. And that's their social media within the company. Then you've got social media outside the company that if I have an issue tomorrow with JetBlue and I'll tweet about it, somebody's going to monitor my bad tweet from JetBlue and go, oh my god, Darius Boomer says we suck. Hold on. Talk to this guy real fast and we've got to recover on this social media issue we just got from Darius Boomer, right? It's two parts of this conversation. So from an ERP company perspective, they're starting to see more and more collaboration tools within that space. So for you guys who are developers again, or if you're going to become an entrepreneur, you can go out there and make a lot of money using social media apps within these organizations inside their four walls and outside their four walls. Last trend, and it's been a trend for over a decade, but they keep on changing the name to what it is. Now we're still calling it big data. So you guys all know what big data is, right? There's one thing called data. There's one thing called information. Well, how do we take what our company already knows within our databases and be more efficient on how we use it? And I'll give you an example. If I'm a company that's using, let's say we manufacture some cogs that goes to certain trucks in America, how do we data mine our current user base, right? We've got customer databases. We've got a manufacturing database of how we make these products. We can still go out there and outsource more data points from social media. How are we use? How are we looked upon by our competitors? How are we looked upon by our other customers that we don't even have yet, future customers? So big data. If you're a data scientist or doing anything with big data in any capacity, 
if you can explore and deep dive into that as a trend, you make a lot of money as well. So it's not all about the making money, but my point is these are six trends that are happening within any company across the globe, and you're going to see them getting more and more money going out to get them to, do, to be better at those kind of things that are happening in the, in the field. So opportunities with, in regards to an ERP consultant or an ERP um, employee. So if you go work for an SAP or for a PeopleSoft or a Workday or Oracle or what have you, um, there's a lot of money to be made in implementations, meaning that they've got customers who are brand new or you can be at customers who are already existing in their, in their ecosystem. So most large-scale ERP um, projects, if you will, will take about two years to implement those, right? Because they're very complex, how we hire employees in our HR system, how we use the manufacturing modules of the software, our accounting component of that software, our external vendors that are out there that we're talking to th through integrations. So these things take a long time. So my point to you guys is an opportunity for you, if you become a consultant or an employee on an ERP package, they make some decent money in regards to um, actual software costs that they're going to sell the software, licensing fees, maintenance fees, hardware again, implementation services. So in my case, I don't sell the software, I don't sell the hardware, I sell implementation of services. So whatever they need to do, as far as people's concerned, they'll hire my company. Training costs. So you guys are in school now. You're dropping some major money to go to school for your degree. Some people still go beyond what you're doing today and get some certifications in their life going forward. So if you get trained to be, let's say, a SAP consultant and you're specializing in data mining, You'll go to an actual class through SAP or whoever's going to pay for it, and they're going to drop some good money for your certification for what you're doing. But being certified means that you know how to push those buttons correctly and how to use their software correctly, right? But there's another part of that conversation. Yes, you're certified, have a degree, but don't have any experience, right? That's, you're missing the, the experience part of that conversation. So once you get your first or two, three or four jobs, you'll have what they call a full life cycle implementation already under your belt. So as you get more and more work as a consultant or as an employee, your value will grow up immensely. But the first part of that is, again, to get certified in some software. Um, job comparisons. If I were to go to school to be a network administrator in New York City, making 60 k out of college, right? If I were an ERP admin, I could make a $72,000. This is based upon... Um, I think it was jobs.com or another site to give me these stats. But at any rate, my point is that if you're aligned to a software package, they're seeing more money versus someone who's generic, is my point. So if you're aligned to a software package or to an industry, you'll make more money because you're more valuable because you're in a smaller pool of talent. Does that make sense? That's my presentation, so I don't want to go much deeper than that. So I want to do a Q&A with you guys real quick. And I want to kind of talk about this some more. So at this point, I think I went pretty fast, right? That was quick. I have coffee in my, in my, in my body already. Um, so is there any question about the industry as far as ERP packages and those six trends in your mind at this point from anybody? Open questions at all? Yes. Um, the question is, do I think it's good to pick your path early? So here's my, um, my two cents on that. Um, there's a book. I'm going to write this down. The book is called, I Don't Know What I Want, But I Know It's Not This. And my point to that book, and I've read the book, it's a good book. Um, sometimes when you come out of college, I hear kids say to me, hey, Mr. Boomer, I'll work for food. Whatever you got, I'll do. And I go, well, that's one way to get a job. I'll do anything at your company. But I think if you can go into a job and say, hey, like a sniper, I want to do that or that, and that's all I want to do. You, di you deep dive into that and that and figure out do you like that and that. And if you don't like it, 
figure it out fast, right? Fast and furious and fail. So my point to you guys is, some of you sitting down today, you know what you want to do when you get out of here in four years. Some of you guys, you do not. So it doesn't matter which way you go. Here's your full life cycle. You're always going to figure out what you want, what you don't like at some point in time. So you can go either way. It's better for you to have an ideology of what you want to do. Uh, for example, my degree was in management science, a generic degree in management. Um, as a child, I had a propensity to be a techie. So I had my first computer at like 17. I learned like Lotus 1, 2, 3, an Excel spreadsheet, and I learned um, WordPerfect prior to Microsoft coming out. And I like working on applications in that regards. And I could fix my, my parents' VCR, and I could do like, you know, small things of the Atari guy. So I know I like software for the most part. So how did I part that into a career path for me? I went to school for four years, got my degree, and I got myself, my first job was uh, with the government, working for the IRS. And I was doing collections, and I hated that job to no end. So then I hear about a job at IBM. I go, oh, IBM's hiring? Okay, I like technology. I'm a pretty smart guy, I think. Take an IBM job. I get there, I'm exposed to all kinds of um, corporate applications, if you will. So I'm going beyond my MS office mentality to what a company actually uses day in and day out. So that exposure was great. The downside was I got fired. I got downsized. They go, you know what, you suck at this. And the good part for me was that it was, a, I think, the gift and the curse, right? I got exposed to new applications that I've never heard of before in my life, but I got fired at this company. However, they did give me a package to get some more education. So I went back to school to DeVry and got me, a, uh, like I think, a cert on CIS. And then my next job after IBM was, I had two options, take a job in finance or IT. The IT job said, hey, if you come work for us at Tiffany & Company, you will travel the globe installing point of sale systems on our dime. I go, wait a minute, I can travel the globe doing systems? Hey, okay, I got a passport. I do it, not knowing if not I'm going to be good, good or not. So my point is, I had, a, I had an idea, right? I left school, it was IRS, didn't like it, went to IBM, I knew what I wanted. I got there, I sucked. I had the brick wall. I had to change, right? I had to adapt, right? So my point to you is try to have an, a direction if you can, but again, I failed fast and furious at IBM, but then I had to readjust, right? So then my next job was an opportunity for me. I got some training, and I got to travel the globe literally doing stores for Tiffany and Company, the jeweler. So I'm going to like the Taiwans and to the Parises of the world and putting hardware and software in their stores and doing J.D. Edwards software. So I learned three things there that was vital to my career path. It was business process, how you run a business. I learned software and hardware that I didn't know before. But more importantly, I learned people across the globe, how you do business in China, how you do business in Korea, how you do business in London. I learned all these things at that job. So my point is, you never know what opportunity was going to give you more in your career path. Did that answer your question? OK. Next person, question at all? Come on, you guys are too quiet. Here we go. Um, so after getting an uh, undergrad degree, um, what's your opinion on next steps? So like, is it more important to go out and get certifications, or do you think it's necessary to get a graduate degree or get a PhD? What, what do you think? Um, the question is, what do I think to do after you finish undergrad? So going back to my, our life cycle, right? I think it depends on you as a person. You know yourself better than anyone, and you've got to figure out in the life cycle, which route you're going to take. So I'm not going to say it's a bad route to go, but you know yourself. And I'll give you an example. I have a niece who went to college, but she didn't want to go. But her parents said, you're going to go for four years no matter what happens. And she gets out and decided, you know, she got her job. My other niece goes to school and decides, I want to take a year off first. I'm not ready to go to school yet. She had a delayed um, process. So for me, if you know what you want from undergrad, meaning graduate school or going to management or what have you, it's great to have a plan, but you don't have to follow that traditional mindset. So if I were you guys, here's my, here's my thought process. Come out of undergrad, hopefully, hopefully you have at least one or two um, internships already so far, 
and find you a job that you like in regards to a path. Am I a software person? Am I a hardware person? Am I a process person? Whatever it might be, find the path somewhere and take that job for one or two years and try to kill yourself in that job, meaning sleep, eat, drink that job day in and day out. Learn that company from top to bottom. Be there every morning at 7 o'clock. Be the first person in and the last one out. Because right now, you have a degree, but you don't have this, right? You want to get that. That's vital for your career path. So you need to get some experience. So I'm not going to not go into graduate school. If you're going to go, I would say go earlier than later. I'm not going to not being certified because, again, they're all good things to get you into this, to get you here, right? That's the life cycle we're going to have. But you've got to figure out what's best for you. Are you more of a going back to school person again, right off the bat, or am I going to wait? Am I an entrepreneur from scratch, or am I a worker bee person? Figure out who you are and then try it out. I think that's your best route for you. You can't follow your friend's path. You've got to follow your path. And again, your path may take you all over the place. I started off in finance, and then I went to marketing, whatever your path might be, but choose something and go for it. And again, you can either fail fast or you can excel. Does that make sense? Okay. Next person. I'm sorry. My biggest, what was my biggest accomplishment? Is it my career path? Um, what I'm most proud of for me has been working on some global systems for clients where their, their employees came back and said, you know what, this is really a good implementation for us. We were happy with what you did for us. That's been the best thing that's ever happened to me in regards to I'm doing a job day in and day out. I'm getting paid for the job. But when someone tells you that, hey, this worked out for us well and we liked it, that's a thumbs up moment. You cannot pay for that moment when they're actually happy versus they get the actual upgrade, they go, this sucks, I hate this, you guys are idiots. I get those probably more than I get, this is a great job, and a pat on my back. So that would be it. But I will say this, though. In my career path in the last 20 years, I've had some great perks, and I can give you two different um, observations, if you will. So my best days as a worker be, um, I'm going across the globe again, doing IT systems for Tiffany's. And my boss goes, if you go to Hong Kong for your next implementation, stay at this hotel. They have Bentleys. Did you say they, got, they have Bentleys? They've got Bentleys. So I'm like, this has got to be a joke. There's no way I'll be in a Bentley from the airport to the hotel. This is never going to happen. Sure enough, I go to Hong Kong to the Peninsula Hotel in Hong Kong. They literally have a fleet of Rolls Royces in their company. I get out of the airplane. On to, to my car driver, I'm in a Bentley going to the hotel. I'm like, this is crazy. I'm not a CEO, I'm not a CFO, I'm just a tech dude. I'm in a Bentley going to my hotel. Like, this is like a great poop pun moment. Like, this is excellent, right? I feel like I've made it. I'm, I mean, I'm already doing like first class flights across and I'm drinking champagne and mimosas in first class. That's pretty cool. But I'm in a Bentley. Like, think about this. I am not a millionaire. So, that was a pretty cool perk. On the flip side, my worst days have been like, I'm doing a client upgrade in D DC for a hospital. And in their PeopleSoft upgrade, we're doing a total upgrade of software. And in my upgrade path, we're doing some database scripts to update the database. Well, lo and behold, I do an accidental upgrade to something wrong, the wrong keys in a database. So now it's all skewed up the database. So at that point, I literally sit there for 48 hours on site with the client with no sleep. I must fix this within two days before they go live. And I'm like dying. I can't go to sleep. We're working hard as all hell. And the client's mad, manager's mad. And I'm like 48 hours straight working like a dog to get it back to where it should have been at. And that's like my worst day ever in life. So you get both good and bad in this job, right? It is what it is. Question? Yes. Okay, so the question was, um, how do I overcome my company's hurdles in regards to becoming an entrepreneur? Yeah. Okay, so I, w I would call myself an accidental entrepreneur. I didn't want to do this path, but I hit a ceiling in corporate America and got tired of people being inefficient and decided I could do it better than them. So it's a quick story. Um, 
Working for Polo Ralph Lauren, we're doing an upgrade of two systems. One's called Ceridian, one's called Lawson. They're both HR systems. One's for Canada, one's for the North America, for U.S. We're going to SAP. So the company brings in Accenture as our consultant. So if you know about Accenture's and PwC's and the KPMG companies, these are the top tier five companies across the globe in regards to consulting. So they're flying like 65 people literally every week upon week on this project. And I tell my boss, look, I'm doing like at least 70 hours a week on my day job here at the company. I don't have time for this part-time project for SAP. So find me someone else to do my job for me when I'm not here. And at the very end, I'll come back and make sure we're on point in the fall. So they do that. I come back to my consultant. Okay, what's, 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 give, me, give me your test plan. Give me your rollout plan. Give me your change management plan. They go, oh, I, I, don't, I don't have all that. That's, you, you, you're you're, you're going to do it. I said, I'm going to do it? No, no, no. We hired for you to do it for me because I was going to be there. Yeah, we didn't do it. You got to do it. I got to do it. So I said, wait a minute. We paid somebody for three months to be here for me on my behalf, but they did nothing except whiteboard sessions and get paid for 40 hours a week doing nothing. So then I decided, great, I can now become a consultant. I've now seen the light that it makes no sense for me as a worker bee to continue doing 70 hour work weeks on salary, not hourly, salary, so no extra money for it, and get beat up after the, the fact. So at any rate, I become an entrepreneur after that job. And as an entrepreneur, my hardest thing in this life cycle was two things. I was going to graduate school to get my MBA, but I wanted to get my own company. And at some point I decided, am I going to continue to be chasing MBAs and being this person who has that as my thing under my umbrella, or just go out here and just do it? So I quit graduate school, jumped out on my own as an entrepreneur, and became a consultant. And my mindset was that I don't have this, I don't have that, but whatever I need in the future, I'll hire somebody who has it, right? And I'll be an entrepreneur. And anyway, my biggest hurdle to doing that was being afraid to do it. That I had a comfy job in corporate America, working for Polo Ralph Lauren, got some nice clothes, you know, nice perks, 401k, I've got a family, I've got a mortgage. That was a fear factor. If I become a consultant and become my own business, what if I fail? Well, ask me, let me answer you this question. As an entrepreneur in America, what's your worst case scenario for your business? What is it? Okay, but what, what could go wrong for me? As in, I have my own company by myself, and if it all goes wrong, what's my worst case scenario that will happen to me? Bankruptcy? Bankruptcy? And, and, anyone else? <laughs> Getting sued for more than what I have? Bankruptcy, what else is the worst case scenario that I could, could go with? I'll have no job and no money, okay. People may not invest my next idea. Anything else? Worst case scenario? Death? Debt? Oh, I could be a lot of debt, okay. <laughs> Anything else? Anyone else? Come on. Give me some more. Worst case scenarios could be what else? These are all great answers. But in my mind, those things were never, ever an issue for me. My worst case scenario is I will go and get a job. That is it. I would be an idiot to work my business to the point where I go bankrupt or lose my house and live on the sidewalk in a cardboard box. I'd be an idiot. My exit plan does not involve bankruptcy. But it's not a bad thing to, be, to go bankrupt in America, obviously, right? You could do that. But in my mind, to get over that hurdle you're talking about being my biggest hurdle was being afraid to fail again. But mind you, again, I've already failed multiple times. I've been fired. I felt my failures would fill this entire campus compared to my wins in my, my, in my career path. So as an entrepreneur for you guys, your biggest hurdle is in the mirror. It is yourself. Forget your friends, your family, your spouse, your parents, your coworkers, whatever. Your biggest hurdle is yourself. If you don't believe in you, then you're never going to go anywhere. And once I figured that out, that it wasn't an issue for anything else going wrong, it was for me to say to myself, I'm going to make this leap of faith, and it's going to be all right. I'm going to jump off the cliff, and I will figure it out. If you can do that, you'll win. But it's between you and the person in the mirror.
is your her, biggest hurdle you're going to have. Anyone else? Questions, comments, concerns? Are you sleeping up in the back there? Am I boring you guys? You guys, you guys are good? Come on. Give me something else. Real life scenarios, real world. What's out there for you guys? Oh, one thing about the uh, career flow. I'll tell you guys. Don't be stuck in America. There's plenty of opportunities outside of our country. So if you get a job in Asia, Europe, wherever, you have to learn a new language, take that opportunity and run. All my colleagues who've taken those jobs out of the country and come back, they come back as VPs. They come back like top dogs because they've got an extra exposure and they took a job that no one would take. And they've come back here, they're, they're winning like crazy. So if I were to go back to myself, you know, my 22-year-old self, I would say, hey, do two things out of college. Either become an, uh, con a consultant with like a big company like an SAP, I mean like, like a, get you a nice job either with like an Accenture or something like that, number one. Number two, get you a job out of the country. Or number three, get you a nice stable job and then start your business up with that money. Those would be about three things that to myself, my younger self. And not wait to do it. When I, was, I, I started my, my first company on my own at the age of 38. I was late in life with that mindset. But prior to that, I've been like a hustler for years. It's hobby jobs. I got to do this on the side, a little side business, but never really being serious about it. So I turned 38 years of age. So I'm 48 now, so it's been 10 years. Come on, guys. Here's some more stuff. I'm, I'm almost done. 50 more minutes, right? Sure. Um, there's a concept. When you guys go to a store, let's say you go to the mini market, and by the cast, they'll say, uh, there'll be a little thing that says, give a penny, take a penny. Give some, take some. So mentorship comes in all types of flavors for you guys. It could be literally me saying, I'm your mentor, or not. Or it could be that I admire what you're doing. You influence me in some capacity. So in my earlier career, when I was here, and I got to the undergrad and got into the job place, I had forgotten about giving back in some capacity. I didn't really go back and try to help out younger people, younger than myself, or colleagues, or a charity. I didn't do those types of things. But now, in hindsight, I think the value for you is in three parts. The number one thing is you'll feel like a better person. I helped somebody or something. At the base value of that, I feel like a good person. The next two value points is that you help that person out to achieve their next goal or whatever it might be. The last thing is about society, right? That if I help build, if I make America better or make, make the, the country or the world better for the next generation of people, that's a good thing. That's a nice, noble ideology that when I came here in 1970 on the planet, when I leave this planet, I want to leave this planet better. And I think if you can do that in regards to charity, it could be a hardcore charity like, you know, the United, United whatever fund or whatever. Or it could be you just helping a friend out or a student in the future. So I think it's important for you to give back in some capacity because, again, you feel better as a person. And it's just the right thing to do. I think it's just the right thing to do. Does, it make, does that make sense to you guys? Okay. Question, someone else? Um, I do three things that I do. Um, I try to keep be, to be well read of, on certain magazines that I like, like a Fast Company, um, PC World, CIO magazine. So if you want to be a CIO, one thing I say about media, if you want to become a CTO, a CIO, or a CEO, read those magazines. If you want to be something, live that space. So back to your question. Um, so I read a lot of magazines. Um, I also network a lot. So if you go to meetup.com, um, I go to a lot of events. It's in Jersey, New York City, and what I've found in the last 10 years is that you guys, in your space of higher education, you guys are well-versed on the hottest and the latest things that are happening trend-wise. So me as an old dog, if I keep on going to old dog meetups and events, I get more old tricks, but I want to know the new tricks. So I go to more events that are for more so higher ed people like yourself. 
you guys are in the mix of what's happening in Silicon Valley. You're in the mix of what's happening in every space of what's happening in technology. So I want to make sure I'm always with you guys and Gen, Gen Z people, because our guys, we're getting old. You guys are at the forefront of it, right? So I'll make sure that, again, I never very well. I'm well read on magazines and books about technology. I can answer your question? Does that make sense? Come on, guys, I'm almost done. I need some more input, interactive. Come on. Yes. To mitigate risk in regards to being an entrepreneur or? So as an entrepreneur, how do I mitigate risk? Um, <laughs> there's three things I think that are vital as a business person you should think about if you venture off to do your own startup. Number one, do I have an expertise that lends someone to pay me money to do it? And if I don't have an expertise, meaning for my company, we sell services, right? We don't own the software. The client owns the software. So when you hire me as Darius Boomer, you're hiring, not that I know how to push the button on the software, you're hiring me because of this. I know all of that, and that was my credentials in the beginning, but I've got experience, right? I've done this multiple times. I know a bad project and a good project, and you're, you're hiring me for that expertise by your industry. So to mitigate myself as, a, as far as me getting more sales or not getting more sales, I keep my focus narrow, like a sniper. I can't service every company across the blue what's the planet. I can't be IBM. I'm a company of one, two or three at the most that I'll hire throughout the year. We're small. So I can't be who I can't be. So I focus on my strengths. I can be agile because I'm small. And I focus again on what I know. I know retail for over a decade. I know manufacturing. I know healthcare from the last five years. So those are my three verticals I have for industry. So I stay in my lane. So when I meet a client in an elevator for my elevator pitch, I go, look, what do you do, Darius? I go, hey, I make you and the CIO seat better. Well, what does that mean? It means if you hire my company to come and do your ERP implementation, you can be rest assured that it's going to go on time, on budget, and you, will, in fact, sleep better because you know it went well. And if you don't hire me, it's going to be bad for you for sleeping for the next six months. So that's my elevator pitch for the company. So again, does that make sense? What I'm saying, I know who I am, I stay in my lane, and I focus to be an expert in my field. I don't want to be everywhere. Learn one thing, learn it well, learn something else, right? Become an SME in your career path. Ladies, you need a question, come on. Ladies, give me a question, come on. Something. Anyone. All right, I, I, the question is, is it good to fake it till you make it? Okay, so I'm gonna give you a real quick uh, lesson and a story. I'm working for Tiffany and Company. They hire a new operations person to be their VP, and I've been director of VP for International Systems. And this person came from Wharton. Okay, I'm, I'm okay with that. We're in a meeting with our London office about a process in their company. And this person does not know the process. So we're in a meeting with like 45 people on the phone. I go, hey, why don't you ask them about that process that you don't know about? I can't ask them that. Why you can't ask them that? Because I don't know it. That's why you should ask them, because it's their process at their company. Since you don't know it, you should ask them the answer. No, I, I can't ask them that. And I go, why? Because then they'll know I don't know. And I said, but you don't know. <laughs> That's the whole point of the conversation. You don't know. So the Wharton way, and I'm not in Wharton or Harvard or Yale, is it's better to look good than to be good. And you can become president on that premise if you want to, OK? However, the way I grew up with my grandparents and my family is it's better to be good and to be good. And people know BS when they, and there's BS. So my point to you is, I wouldn't go on my career path not getting into a deep dive into whatever it might be. So when I say I eat, sleep, and drink this company, or that software, or that hardware, I literally sacrifice family time, friend time, watching my TV time to study and learn my craft. Like, I live it. 
it's engulfed in me. I wouldn't feel right to leave my company to a client and I don't know what I'm talking about. So I live my life that way, that I engulf myself in it. And this is how I, well, so it's not a bad way to live your life being to look good but not be good, but I don't believe in that. Does that make sense? And it's not a bad thing. I mean, some people get through life going that route, but it makes no sense to me. Anyone else? I got, how much time I have left? I think you're at it. I'm at it? All right, guys, thank you so much for your time. Have a good day.